Hello. Can you hear me? Yeah? I can. I can hear myself now. Yep. Hi, welcome to uh, Design Patterns in an Expressive Language. That expressive language that I'm talking about is called JavaScript, formerly known as ECMAScript or LiveScript. Any of those will do just fine. I have some housekeeping that I have to announce, so um, just bear with me for about 30 seconds. Um, there are two session changes. Uh, one of them has been rescheduled, the uh, surprisingly rockin' JavaScript, they spelled that wrong, and DOM programming in GWT, or GWT, whatever you want to call that. It'll take place at 2 p.m. in week 9. <coughs> yeah, that's correct. That's what it says here. Uh, the other thing is they're going to repeat a session, building a scalable web application with Google Apps Engine. That's going to go on in room 8 at 12.45 p.m. And lastly, all sessions, excluding the fireside chats, will be posted by mid-next week on the Google I.O. website. Cool. Thanks. All right. So, um, yeah, surprisingly, this talk doesn't have a whole lot to do with Google. It's just more or less focused on design patterns within a very uh, peculiar language that we all like to use on the web today. It's mostly used on the web, even though it's finding its way onto other different clients and whatnot. But for the most part, we're stuck with a browser. Um, I'm going to be using Firefox for my presentation. I wouldn't bother actually whipping this up in, uh, in any other browser right now. I threw this together in about five minutes. I'm not talking about the presentation. I'm just kind of talking about the actual slideshow framework for it. Um, but it works. So. Um, <clears throat> First off, wow, that was an awesome echo. A um, little about what about uh, sorry, a little bit about what I do at Google. I'm a user interface engineer, or the newer term is just web developer. A lot of us like to call ourselves web developers. Um, specifically, I work in user experience, so it's a very um, sort of hybrid role between engineering and user experience, where I work with interaction designers, visual designers. Um, researchers, things like that. So I'm, allowed, I'm around a lot of people with Photoshop or looking at logs or um, data to find out how users use our products, things like that. Um, as far as specific products, I've worked uh, somewhat on AdWords where they were kind of using GWT and that was not really my thing. Um, so I was able to implement a lot of their front end stuff. Uh, most recently, Gmail, where we're trying to do some cool stuff with that. And lastly, um, in the beginning, I did some platform CSS, and now I'm just getting involved with some of the JavaScript. Um, you don't need to look at me, so that's kind of boring. Um, <clears throat> when I first started at Google, I, I came from a background of working at Yahoo, where everyone primarily just used YUI. And we had uh, Crockford sort of leading that whole sort of force of getting everyone involved in writing better JavaScript. I learned a lot from Crockford myself, and actually I have a couple examples that are pulled directly from his website and his book. Um, so let's get started talking about JavaScript. First off, it's really simple. It's a small, small language that you can do a lot of things with. For the record, almost everything is an object, and it has things like loose typing, which is good or bad depending what kind of background you come from. It has a decent DOM API. So what I mean by that is if you're going to work in a browser, you need something to gain access to all those DOM elements on a page. And JavaScript has an API, or yeah, that API is called the DOM. And um, what I'm saying about that is basically it's it's okay in some ways. Other ways, it's kind of funky. It's extremely flexible and it's expressive. Um, that's kind of what we're going to get into a little bit today, and also diving into some patterns that have originally came from what is it, the, the Gang of Four design patterns book, or specifically software design patterns. So uh, obviously I like to take a lot of photography, so some of my photos will show up in some of these slides. But um, first off, JavaScript has rough edges. And uh, this kind of comes from a backstory of, I don't know, it, it's the classic user experience story of users feel that a product is broken if the interface is broken. Uh, a lot of times if, um, you're trying to 
I don't know, check mail or something, and uh, something just breaks in JavaScript or something. Some console error happens, and then you just can't use the product anymore. The interface is busted or something like that. And uh, when really people blame that problem on JavaScript, when really it's just the interface. So a lot of times it's not JavaScript's fault, it's how it was implemented. If you have something like a shovel and the handle's broken, people think the shovel is broken, even though technically you can still shovel things. But since we're using this stuff up here and we have to implement this stuff, we think the problem's up here. <coughs> or, sorry, we think the problem's at, at the bottom where the shovel is. So it obviously has a bad history. Um, another thing, prototypal inheritance. Um, this is something that a lot of people don't actually like, and it's one of the few languages that actually still does it. Um, there's some that go way back. Um, but this, as I'm going to talk about, is actually a good thing. Um, another thing, there's two types of prototypal inheritance, or just generally two types. There's a <coughs> inheritance by delegation, and there's another one called concatenation. JavaScript implemented the delegation type, which is essentially has a, it has the ability to take that prototype and propagate that same object onto all the other ones that inherited from it. Whereas the other one, concatenation, it just makes a copy of it and it makes it hard to actually delegate all those uh, changes onto the rest who inherited from it. It has some bugs, um, but like I was saying, these bugs actually exist in the browser that had to implement these things. So if you actually look at the language itself, there's, there's not a whole lot of things wrong with it. And plus there's not a whole lot to get wrong since it's fairly small. In the end, JavaScript is still the king of programming languages, but of course, that's my own personal opinion. Um, it's obviously the one I work in most of, and I didn't have exactly the best background experience coming from PHP. <laughs> We're like, oh, PHP. Yeah, PHP 4, too. Anyway, um, but it survived all these years. So now this is what we use, and obviously I'm using it today just to show my presentation. So obviously it's done something good for us. <coughs> How did we get here? If anyone knows this guy, his name's Jeremy Keith. He wrote a book called Dom Scripting, and he, I think he went on to write another one called Bulletproof Ajax or something like that. And so the way we use it is obviously very heavily influenced by what we can actually do in a browser, not the actual features that are implemented in JavaScript. So someone like Jeremy Keith helps us write better JavaScript as far as DOM scripting. Um, he's very big into scripting the DOM, obviously, and using it in a way that's going to help better our user experience. Not a whole lot to do with JavaScript. It's just JavaScript is the tool that we have to use. But it's been known to make people cry, right? So there, there's, there's really weird kind of bugs in this. Just an example, we can kind of pull up my console here and um, we can run stuff on the fly just in a nice little tool called Firebug. If you haven't heard of Firebug, go to getfirebug.com, implement it, or sorry, install it into your Firefox browser. There might be some bugs in Firefox 3. I'm not sure if he's updated it yet, though. So we can try something like A is a new number. We'll say 5. We'll say B is a new number. We'll say that's 6. And you get this nice long is this is this cutting in and out? Am I doing fine? Oh, it is. <laughs> so um, something fun. We can uh, we can log both of these and we can pass in an arbitrary amount of arguments into this log function. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna add up A and B and I'm also gonna check to see if they equal sorry, let me just make this five. So five and five, that should be ten, and this should obviously be true, but we get 10 and false because they're different objects. And like I was saying, everything in JavaScript is an object. So if it's a different object, it doesn't necessarily mean they're going to be equal to each other. However, you did notice this is kind of a wacky way to make new instances. There's uh, just regular type numbers and there's objects of numbers. If we did that, we can get true just because they're just made of numbers rather than new instances of these objects. Um, another cool thing, like I was saying, everything in JavaScript is an object. Uh, I 
think I eventually get to these things. <coughs> so let's say we'll work with another number. So we'll say var c is 5. What we can do is we can say var d is 6. And we can say e is going to be equal to p string. Notice that we have this variable c, which is this number of 5, and we can call methods right off of it. That's another reason to you know, say that JavaScript is obje object-oriented. Um, next, we can say d to string, and we can log that. And of course, you get 56 rather than 11. That simple uh, string concatenation. Anyway, um, that was just sort of proving that everything is an object in, in some way or another, in one form or another. Perspective of JavaScript. So programmers of other languages often come to JavaScript and they see this plain like thing up front. And it's fairly small. It's boring. Um, not a whole lot of color to it. But really, in reality, you get to something that is a lot more colorful, it's flexible, um, has multiple good parts to it, and it's really easy to work with. For the record, Domopoon says JavaScript is object-oriented. Listen to him. Objects. So these are the objects that I was talking about. We have objects, objects, object objects. We have function objects. We have array objects, obviously strings, booleans, numbers, uh, regular expressions. These all have methods, and they all sort of follow up the chain on inheriting up to the object object and up to the object's prototype object. Lexicals. The fact that it's so small, I can go through and explain pretty much everything in the language in just a couple of slides. So it has operators, right? Has things like the dot notation or subscript. You can call methods off those. Has basic, basic arithmetic. You can compare stuff. It has assignments, has conditionals, right? If, else's, and switches, and and ors. Statements, pretty much anything followed by a semicolon. <coughs> Lastly, it has most of the major keywords, and there are other reserve words that you can actually use, but those are the ones we can work with for now. Obviously, there's more, but um, I use these probably 90% of the time. Another cool thing about JavaScript is that it has the ability to call things as constructors. And notice it's using this new feature called, or it's calling a, a feature where you call this new keyword just in front of the function, and magically it becomes a constructor. Uh, JavaScript is known to be a classless type of language, and um, the only way we can kind of differentiate that is um, through, I'm sorry, the only way we can kind of like pull that apart is by using all these different kinds of objects. Scopes and closures. This tends to confuse a lot of different people. But it has something known as the global scope. Um, Crockford will say this is generally a bad idea. And there's no way to implement real namespaces. Um, you have things like local scope. And anything in or outside of that has a regional scope. You have something in here that everything inside of this function has access to all the things outside of it. So I can call this, or I can access this bar string inside of this func function. But anything inside of this function inside here, I wouldn't have access to any of the variables that live within this func function. And obviously, this is a global string that can be accessed from anywhere within that particular window. So design patterns. Um, this obviously goes back, like I was saying, to the gang of four principles where you have a set of software patterns that can be reused um, in a way that isn't particularly for the sake of code reusability, but just pattern reusability. So it's not in one sense so you can implement a framework where you're constantly using the same code over and over. Not that that's not a great thing, but the purpose of design patterns is so you can take them and in any given situation, you know how to implement something with a given set of knowledge. You can say, oh, we can just use a subscriber pattern. We can publish these events. Or 
you know, we can just make a facade and make this a lot easier for different kinds of browsers so we don't have to deal with all the bugs that we got to deal with and whatnot. Uh, another thing, people remember patterns. So this is just sort of a given. Uh, in user experience, we try and look for these patterns. Even though this has to do with software, the same goes with interfaces. Um, if you notice in one of the sessions yesterday, a lot of people like to remember um, this anytime you get prompts, um, it's just generally a bad idea. If, you know, you have the, the, the notion of wanting to always click the same button over and over. You know, do you want to delete this? Yes. Do you want to delete this? Yes. Sooner than later, you're just going to hit yes and, oh, wait, I didn't actually want to delete that. <coughs> it creates a common language. So a common language is usually better for software teams. Um, design patterns are always specifically useful if you're just working by yourself or if you're a freelancer. Not that it's not good to know about them, but um, it's really useful when you're in teams and you have to work with other people and you have to tell them, oh, we're going to you know, use a this type of pattern or that type of pattern, they can automatically know what you're talking about and it'll be easy for the entire team to do the same sort of work. So here's the patterns. Um, I wrote a book not too long ago. Uh, I'm not going to talk about that too much. Well, I'm not going to like really sell the book or anything, but this is specifically what the book kind of talks about. Um, these are primarily the, the patterns that we use in the book. Uh, the person I wrote it with is from Yahoo. And he was actually an ex-coworker and a good friend of mine. But um, we split up these different patterns and we wrote about them. Singleton is obviously a very simple pattern where you can have these object literals and you can throw a bunch of uh, methods underneath it. Factories uh, is where you can create some sort of object factory where you don't have to know about which instance you're getting and whatnot. Um, Bridges, composites, facades. I'll get into a little bit more about these in the next couple of slides. Um, other useful things in JavaScript. It has inheritance, and like I was saying, prototypal inheritance. Um, it, has the, it doesn't exactly have the ability to create interfaces, but there's a way you can sort of fake that. Um, the ability to chain, obviously, the jQuery library takes this uh, sort of feature and goes nuts with it, where you can chain everything. Um, grab some selector, you can hide it, and then you can append some class name to it, and you can make an Ajax call, and you can dump in some content, all like in one line of JavaScript. Encapsulating. Encapsulating basically comes down to one thing, which is functions. And that abuses functions in a way that, well, not abuses them, it, it takes them so you can hide different kinds of information. And it's the only way we can sort of get private variables in JavaScript. And of course, expressing yourself. And uh, this is all about JavaScript. And uh, I don't know. W when I think of it and, and I compare it to other languages, like for instance, Java, um, one of the neat things about Java is you can have this full set of tools and you can you know, get in your big IDE and you have this giant interface where you got you know, the ability to look up any class at any moment. You got a giant tree on the left, um, things like that. And JavaScript, on the other hand, is most often programmed in editors like TextNet. It's more like the ninja kind of a language, whereas Java is more like a tank. Both of them have their benefits in one sense, but I generally like to be a ninja. <laughs> classes. So this is one way that we can write classes in JavaScript. Um, this might be a little confusing since I already said JavaScript is a class-free language. Well. Sense we, we call them classes in the sense that these are constructors and we can make new instances of them and we can inherit from their prototypes. So here I have class and I'm going to set foo method on it and then I'm going to set a bar method on it. Now I call this new class, assign it to sunk, and I can call foo and then I can call bar. Here's a second way. I can call, uh, you know, I can create this new class called class and then I can set its entire prototype to an object literal, and I can set all of its methods and properties on it directly. Instead of having to do it like in all these separate lines, it's just one big shot. A lot of classical programmers kind of like this style because it keeps it sort of all tucked in one area. Um, nevertheless, it, this doesn't mean that it can't be mutated later and we can change those properties, which often 
bugs other people about the network, but that's also a cool thing about it too, is that these objects can be changed at any given time. <coughs> Here's a third way. This is uh, semi-borrowed from Crockford. Um, I left out one part in particular where we can have a method method. And as I talked about, even functions are objects. So I can set a method method onto the prototype of this function object where I pass in a name and I can pass in a function. So that way I can say class.method, I can pass in a string of foo, and I can set that method there. Later on, I can even go even further and set the bar one. <laughs> set the bar. That's funny. Okay. Uh, expressiveness uh, for, the, for the last slide. You can see the one thing I changed in it is that I returned this. Now you can see I can actually chain these things together. So I can say class dot method, pass in the arguments, dot method bar. I can go dot method, dot method. Just because I returned the self, or I returned itself to itself, and we can constantly add more to it. And uh, I actually made one small mistake with the slide. If I return this inside of the foo method or the bar method, I can consistently chain those together as well. This is pretty much what makes up jQuery in its entirety, where everything is returning itself over and over and over. So chaining is actually really, really simple. Uh, so uh, another thing about expressiveness. So you can actually take something where you get foo, you can get bar, you can add event listeners to them, and you do this thing where you set, this, you set the, the class name to active, set its color to green, up its font size a little bit, and this is not even cross-browser. You can turn this into just a couple of lines of JavaScript, implement chaining, you can get foo bar, and on click you run these functions. And this one, let's just pretend that it is cross-browser. And this is part of the expressiveness that a lot of people enjoy in JavaScript, and it helps them to build things really quickly. So here's just a sample Im implementation of this. So this is using that uh, that method method, you can see here I've created a closure on the whole entire set of code. So this is a way of hiding my implementation of my, sorry, hiding the implementation of my framework. So now I'm in a closure, and I create this private function called under bar dollar, where it passes in a set of elements. And now I'm going to set a add event method to that under bar dollar, and I'll you know give it an interface where element type function, then I have an add class function, and I have a set CSS function, and I'm, I can make a publicly available dollar function where all I do is pass in any of the arguments that were sent to it and delegate it to the private implementation. <coughs> Singletons. So this is very simple. This is a, a very simple way to just sort of encapsulate your code. Gosh, that's getting annoying. What's that? Oh, is it doing it too much? Okay. Good? All right. Sorry about that. <laughs> All right. Was that annoying or what? Jeez. <laughs> okay. Anyway, uh, singletons are dom uh, get class. <laughs> what? No, okay. Sorry. <laughs> anyway, um, so it's a it's a really simple way to tuck all your methods into sort of one object. Uh, this is also a form of namespacing, and it's kind of the best way we can do this right now. Here I can, you can see that I tucked in a bunch of similar methods on the DOM, like getting an element or adding a class name or you know getting its coordinates in the DOM. Uh, events, I can have a listen function, unlisten, remove all. And this is a, a really simple way to just organize code, um, just setting an object literal to these uh, variables. Bridges. Bridges are pretty simple. Um, bridges are basically a way to decouple the implementation from the actual code. So you have things like uh, this function called get beer by ID. 
can't actually see that, can you? There's a better way to do this. Quit it. Fire bug. Delete the element. All right. All right. I'm gone. OK. <laughs> so this is uh, a function called get beer by ID. And I'm going to run this on a callback, right? The only problem is get beer by ID takes in this event object. It should take in actually an ID. And then you can see here that I can get the ID by this.id. The good way of actually implementing this is to create a bridge function. Um, you can do that by just saying get beer by ID bridge, or you can actually create an anonymous function. Anonymous functions usually are a good way to, I don't know, just make simple callbacks. And then you can call your actual get beer by ID and pass in an ID. Bridges are also useful um, in the sense of just good API development. Like if I were to use this first one, it would be a little bit hard to unit test because I would have to call it in the scope of an element. Um, likewise, I wouldn't be able to call it from the command line without passing in this stupid event object. If you're going to unit test it, you would most likely want to pass in an ID, not call it from some element. Um, let's see here. Factories. So factories is a good way to not know sort of what's going on behind the scenes. I just want to call some function, and it's going to return to me the correct instance. Is it doing it again? OK, all right. So here I can call this function, just call it get button. And it doesn't have to know about the current theme that it's in. If it's in a fancy theme, it's going to return a fancy button. Otherwise, it's just going to return some ordinary button. That way, I can just say button equals get button. And it'll, you know, depending on what theme I'm in, um, let's say some web page has multiple themes, it's just going to figure that out for you. And you can set its content, push me, button render. So your implementation is going to stay the same, and you have this factory doing all the factory work. Adapters. Adapters are a good way to sort of move, I don't know, from one set of code to another code. A lot of times, adapters are useful when you have to keep legacy code lying around, which is often the case in larger companies. Um, or if you just have one JavaScript library and you want to use another JavaScript library now. So here I, I give a, a simple example of having the dollar function versus a get function. They pretty much do the same thing. This is kind of the big difference between like the, the prototype JavaScript framework or YUI or jQuery and things like that. It's all the same stuff in the end. You, you get the same kind of interface. But the way you write this code is slightly different. So this dollar function takes in any arbitrary amount of arguments. So you can see here I have element, comma, element 2, comma, element 3, whereas the get function takes in one argument, but it's an array of elements. So here I can write these two simple adapters depending which way I'm going in the code. Dollar to get, it just returns get, and it passes in whatever arguments were passed to this dollar to get function. Secondly, the get to dollar takes in an array, and then it calls it and applies all of those array elements and, re and runs that dollar function. <coughs> facades. So facades are pretty much implemented in every single JavaScript library today. You, it would be safe to say that pretty much anything that deals with cross-browser bugginess or works around some bad API or whatnot implements this facade pattern. So facades is basically a way to create a higher level interface that you can work with. And although it doesn't do anything that great, it just makes it less buggy, less error prone, and easier to unit test. Um, for instance, here, events.listen. I can pass in an array of elements, and I can pass in an array of different kinds of event types. And I can pass in multiple callbacks. This isn't to say that I can't directly do this in JavaScript itself. I can write a whole bunch more code to it, but this doesn't do anything special except give me a lot of flexibility in how I work with the framework. Um, patterns should not be forced. So there are good sides to patterns, there are bad things. Um, if you're just implementing a web page, you don't have to go out and buy the design patterns book 
and start creating this giant framework. Uh, a lot of times it does introduce more code. Um, you have to I don't know, work harder at trying to maintain it sometimes. In the end, it's supposed to make it easier to maintain with larger groups of people in your software team. Um, yeah, like I said, it introduces code bloat. And a lot of times, when people first dive in, into design patterns, they just implement patterns for the sake of saying, hey, look, I'm doing design patterns. Look at me. And it doesn't really get them anywhere. And it, oftentimes, you might end up using the wrong pattern for the wrong kind of solution. Um, or, yeah, you end up with the wrong solution. So, closing. JavaScript is not evil. <laughs> it's very simple. Um, it has a lot of the expressiveness uh, that makes it more ninja-like, and it's easy to use, and obviously it's sort of what we're stuck with now. Um, JavaScript is beautiful, and it encourages this sort of artistic kind of programming. Like I was saying, you can do lots of different kinds of things. If you come from class-based, you can use this method method that I was talking about. Um, that was one of the methods that I borrowed from Douglas. Um, have an imagination and experiment with it. I talk about innovating the wheel rather than reinventing the wheel. A lot of times, it's fun to take existing code out there that you can find in frameworks and sort of tweak it. Um, reinventing the wheel is just sort of writing extra code for the sake of writing code. But never feel bad about trying to make something even better. Um, dig through the prototype code, or dig through jQuery, or YUI, and things like that. Uh, Google just recently re released uh, a thing called Doctype, which has a lot of our code that we've used in some of our apps, like Gmail, and Calendar, and whatnot. Um, you can look at some of the patterns there. All these patterns exist in libraries today. Um, fortunately, we reap the benefits of that, and we get to use these really fancy facades and it makes it really cool and easier to work with. So Domo says, buy this book. You don't have to listen to him. Um, if you're not working in JavaScript all the time or not working with teams, it's not really all that recommended, but that's pretty much it. And um, you can find this slideshow at dustinviews.com forward slash IO. Yeah, if there are any questions, uh, feel free to walk up to the mic. Hi, Justin. I um, really enjoyed your talk. I was a little unclear on why you used um, dollar sign um, to name some of your functions. I mean, the first thing that comes to mind is that that's to signify a variable, but I'm not quite sure um, so what you're using it for. Why use a dollar? Um, actually, I agree. It's kind of a stupid name for a function. That was originally popularized by the prototype JavaScript framework as a simple and easy way to get a lot of elements at once. Since one of the most common things we do when we're scripting the DOM is getting elements. So naturally, instead of calling something get or get element or something that gets repeated all the time, they just called it dollar. And it was sort of classy at the time. Granted, newcomers of JavaScript get a little confused from it, but it is what it is. And I don't know. It's pretty much the inspiration of jQuery as well. So, dollar is dollar. <laughs> Hi. Can you talk a little bit about inheritance in JavaScript and how that can be implemented? And how what now? And how that can be implemented? Yeah. So a simple way is everything inherits from the prototype. Um, I mean, I don't know if we can we can write code and whatnot, but if I say something like, you know, var func is this function. That's not right. But, and I set func's prototype to, I set a bar function. Um, a lot of times when we're subclassing, one of, the uh, one of the classic ways of doing this is basically just saying, you know, um, func subclass and you set it to the new, or sorry, you have your function. Does that make sense? So this way you kind of inherit all the, all the properties that are on this thunk object and you set them to the prototype. And you can go ahead and set 
new ones onto it, or you can override them. But that's the basic way that um, you know you inherit from these other objects. If you change any of those other methods on that thunk object, this subclass is going to inherit those as well, and that change is going to propagate onto those subclasses. Hi, uh, you talked about encapsulation to make certain variables private. Yeah. Um, so in other words, storing stuff inside a function or basically a closure to, um, to get so the stuff on the outside can't see it. But uh -huh. do you think it's possible that like doing so would make the code difficult to read for other people? Yeah, um, difficult to read for other people. So private methods are generally implemented two different ways. There's the way that plays friendly with um, being able to debug it a lot easier. Um, there's the classic convention of adding an, under, an underbar to the name of the function. So if I had this bar, but I wanted it to be private, uh, Google uses a convention where we put an underbar at the end of it. That just denotes, hey, don't really mess with this function. Don't publicly call it, although it's still publicly available. Um, about two years ago, I think the YUI blog demonstrated something just called the module pattern where you can have a function. Bar f is this function. And uh, you basically write all of its private members in here. Var foo is six and var thunk is, you know, hello. And you return an object with those public methods. So you can say, say hello is function or, you know, get foo. And this returns foo. And immediately after this function is called, you invoke it. So that way, this object is returned to this variable. And I don't know, if that's too hard to read, then I guess, um, I don't know, just use the other way. <laughs> but uh, could you maybe talk a little bit about the upcoming changes to like uh, like ECMAScript or JavaScript or whatever? And yeah, how I that might. Kind of like, uh, affects a lot of the design patterns and the way that you could do prototypical inheritance and stuff like that. Yeah, I mean, a lot of people would say some of these patterns are a little hacky because it's working with pretty much JavaScript 1.5. Um, and I think that's where, I think JScript, their equivalent version number is around that same sort of number. But um, the best person to talk to is either Douglas Crockford about that or um, I don't know, Brendan Nike or possibly John Riesig, who's on Mozilla. And they say it's supposed to be backwards compatible, and I'm going to go ahead and believe that for now. And um, But some of these changes, it's not that any of these are actually going to break, but they are going to give us new ways to implement these class-based systems. Um, I'm not sure if it's going to become or still remain classless, but... Um, I don't know. I kind of still enjoy working with what we have now, and it's very simple and expressive, and there's not a whole lot of things that are broken in it right now. But. Can you talk a little bit about uh, memory leaks in JavaScript and best practices to avoid it? Sorry, memory what was leak? Memory leaks. Oh, memory. Mm -hmm. Oh, gosh, memory. Um, so, yeah, as Brennan said, threads suck, so we don't have threading. I kind of enjoy that as well because it allows you to work in one stream. Um, my mind's often only stuck in one thread anyway. Um, as far as memory goes, a lot of libraries will clean that up for you. So there's improvements to browsers and whatnot. I wouldn't change a whole lot of the way you write JavaScript now. Just kind of follow things that are going on in today's blogs and whatnot. Um, it doesn't seem to be JavaScript problem. It's basically browsers need to get better and handle that memory a lot better. Uh, things like Google Gears are obviously trying to make that better and implement HTML5 features and create sort of this, um, I don't know, this facade of multi-threading, but um, and it's also able to store local data and things like that. So as far as memory, there's other people working on it, but um, I wouldn't change a lot of your habits now just because a browser is doing it really badly.
uh, in your current work, uh, do you have a particular pattern from the book that you just see yourself going back to, you know, daily and you go, oh, that's one I, you know, really use a lot? Yeah, um, one I actually didn't talk about is the publisher subscriber pattern. And um, that's basically a way to publish custom events to the implementer. So you can have things beyond just normal click, focus, blur, mouse over, mouse out. These are all basic DOM events that you get with each browser and that they were shipped with. Um, on another notion, um, if you go through some of the, the code on Google, um, with the, the new release of Doctype. Um, it's very influenced from Dojo, where everything's sort of event-driven. And it's pretty cool in the sense that you can use the same interface, but listen to different kinds of events. So a regular example is you can have Doog events listen, and you can have your element, and you can click, and you can run your callback, right? That's all handy and normal. But the cool thing is you can actually say, I'm going to have some animation, you know, I'm going to say Goog effects DOM, I don't know. Um, let's just say this is some animation class, right? And we pass in its parameters and it's like, here's the element and it's going to go to some X and Y, whatever. And it's going to take five seconds to get there. And the neat thing is, now I can say, Goog, listen to this animation object. And I'm going to listen to its start event. And it's going to run my callback. And then I can do the same thing, listen to its tween event. And I can listen to its you know, end event. And run all these different kind of functions, all using the Goog events listen. And it works with both DOM and regular events. And so this pattern is constantly used over and over. And it's basically a broadcasting system, so known as publisher, subscriber, or uh, I forget the other common name for it. Does anyone know what that is? Uh, it escapes my head. But anyhow, yeah. Hope that kind of answers. Could you talk uh, a bit more about JavaScript testing? Testing, yeah. Testing's kind of a big deal um, at Google. It's something I don't do a whole lot of. Um, <laughs> mostly because I don't like doing it because testing is not fun for me. But there's like a whole testing mercenary grouplet and whatnot. And, um, but the fact is you should test your code. Um, basically anywhere you go, you're going to have things like JS unit or you can run things um, in, uh, what's that live one in Firefox? Uh, Selenium. You can run Selenium tests. You can check things if they're the right height and whatnot. If you're building a CSS framework, you can check to make sure um, the right font sizes are getting set, or grids are the right width and things like that. Um, yeah, testing, as far as debugging goes, use things like Firebug. Uh, they say JavaScript is hard to debug, but you can run everything on a console. You can log them. You can inspect them. Um, you know, if you, if you open up uh, Google's JavaScript library in your browser and you console.log Goog, you can inspect every single thing <coughs> Sorry, you can ex inspect every single object that's in that, every method. The same with YUI. If you log the Yahoo object, you'll see that DOM is in there. You know, well, it'll say Yahoo util, it'll be event, DOM, drag and drop, and all those things. And it's a really simple way to figure out what's going on in, in your little <laughs> um, app or whatever. So, yeah. Anyhow. Cool. We have about 15 minutes, so go grab drinks and coffee. And if you want to come chat, I'll be up here at front.